Comedia scene by Diego Cruz. Character is Professor Whimsy. Today, I shall speak about the power of life. Yes, there is power in life. I, lucky you, have tapped into that power. Now, before you ask me what and how about this power of life, I will tell you, of course, free of charge, but you know, donations, you know, will be accepted. 20, uh, $20 here and there. And um, that would be the best, thanks. Okay, power of life. Where initially starts by asking, why is it that I at the bottom of life instead of on the top? I cried aloud more I cried aloud than I realized. I heard, I mean, so hard that after that, it is impossible for me to even cry again. Boom. Power happened. You look at me like he's God sent. Maybe I am. So I unlocked a part of the brain called resotransfor science that didn't even know about, they didn't even know about. Like places you often go everywhere. You look at other places instead of where you are at the said, made, complete, and total sense power of life is amazing. I'm still figuring things out. I hope this hearing, or better yet, lesson, made you want to unlock this force. And a quick reminder, don't forget the donations of $50 and up. May the power of life be with you. Film-inspired scene by Diego Cruz. The characters are Chucky, he's a doll who hurts people, and Andy, who was hurt by Chucky throughout his life. Betty, Chucky is at home, deciding to call Andy to apologize. That rhymes, Chucky calls Andy, and Andy answers the phone. Hello? Hey, Andy, it's me, Chucky. Don't hang up, hang up, hear me out, kid. How dare you call me evil bean? How'd you get my number? God, please, just stop. Andy, Andy, I get it. You hate me. I get it. But I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to be what's on my shirt. I'm a good guy. <laughs> now, I want to say I'm sorry. Are you serious? This is a joke to you, Chucky? You think life is one big joke? I'm going to hang up now. Andy, I'm serious. No more hurting people. You're my first for me to hurt. I figure I should start with you. You know, you know how hard it is to get your number every time you move? I'm on the verge of losing my mind. You've been the reason why my life is shattered. I have no life. I'm sorry, Andy. I'm sorry. I don't want to harm you anymore or anyone. I remember the look you had at the times of our epic fight. It wasn't fair to you. I was lost. You're the devil. Leave me alone. Andy, Andy, you have to, you have to let go of all this. I have, um... What? What? You are a man. I'm kind of too. <laughs> we can solve this and move on as adults. So if I forgive you, you're leaving me in peace? Yes, Andy, yes. That's what I'm telling you right now. Okay, okay, Chucky, you win. I forgive you. Chucky, just don't hurt people anymore, please. I'm a good guy now. I won't do it. I have so many people to call. Goodbye, Charles. <laughs> Goodbye. Goodbye, Andy. I will miss you so much. End of scene.
on an inspired scene by Rigoberto Ganceda, the characters are Bob, a skinny turkey, and Rob, a fat turkey, spending his fall at the Butterball Farm mid afternoon. At rise, Bob and Rob are walking around. Would you look at that? What, Bob? What is it? Right there, Big Rob. Okay, it's a tree. It's the same tree we pass by. Why, yes, it is, but but look at the leaves. They are they're no longer green. They're they're yellow now. So what? Who cares about that? Well, Rob, once those leaves are brown and begin to fall, some of our friends will no longer be with us, especially the fat ones. Yeah, I'm fat. Does this mean that I'm going away? Wait a minute. You helped me get this way. Yes, Rob, your time here is almost up. And yes, I did help you get fat. Why? I have kept myself skinny because many moons again, I noticed that the skinny turkeys got left behind and the fat ones leave to never be heard from again. So I pick a new guy every year and give him three eighths of my feed. I eat enough to live and share the rest because I do not want to know where they take us. You set me up. You are the reason all Blackout. End of scene. A Magical Realism Scene by Rigoberto Gansira. Sonny is a 16 year old and he is with his mother Rosa, who is a 32 year old. They're in Sonny's bedroom. Sonny is sitting on his bed listening to his music on his phone. Rosa walks into the room. So Gamma. I've been calling you. Are you hungry? No, Ma. I'm, I'm not hungry. I'm just here getting ready for practice. I have to be there in 30 minutes. Have you done your homework? You know the rule. Homework first. School before hoops. You know that, mijo. I did most of it. I only have to read a few more chapters from my history class, but I'm going to knock that out on the, the on tomorrow, on the bus tomorrow. No, so you have to knock that out now or else no hoops. Ma, this is gonna take me longer than 30 minutes. Mira, Ma, I promise to read it as soon as I come back. He gets up and picks up his backpack and tennis shoes for practice. She stands in the doorway. Look here, young man. I may only be this five foot Mexican, but you're sick too, but it's still my little boy. And you are not just gonna leave like that. And why are you still wearing those old Nikes? I bought you a new pair. Why are you not using those? Mom, I would never disrespect you. And I'm gonna finish my homework. I give you my word. Now, can you please move? She stays in the doorway. I'm gonna hold you to it. But what about the shoes? Uh, Ma, you know these are my, my lucky Jordans? Dad gave them to me. And you know he had, had them Blessed by Grandma June. And you know Grandma June is a God-fearing woman. Grandma June is just a crazy lady. And knowing your dad, I bet money he never had her bless them. Besides, they're worn out. You could hurt yourself. Ma, Grandma June is not crazy. And even if dad be asking me, they are still my lucky Jordans. I've had seven triple doubles in them. I'm telling you, they're magical. Hi, mijo. Use them, but if you get hurt, I don't want to hear you cry because you and me know you cry. She leans in and hugs him. But it's okay. You will always be my little cry baby. He hugs her back. Mom, I love you, but you really are a jerk. Yes, that may be the case, but at least I don't believe in magical shoes. End of scene. Comedy scene by Rigoberto Ganceda. Characters are Chelly, 
a 17-year-old Mexican-American girl who is on her way to college, and Ricky, a 17-year-old Mexican-American boy who is a high school dropout. The setting is in the parking lot of Planned Parenthood. At Rise, Chelly and Ricky are sitting in Chelly's car, staring at the front door of Planned Parenthood. I never thought I'd be here. How did my life end up here? This was not in my plans. Why are you freaking out? What do you mean? I'm sitting in front of Planned Parenthood with you in my car. What if someone sees us? Who cares? Besides, you didn't have to give me a ride if you didn't want to. You're my neighbor, and we've known each other all our lives. Of course I'm going to give you a ride. Chelly, then stop freaking out. I'm going to go in and fill out this job application, and then we can leave. Just hurry up before someone thinks I'm here for me. Relax. Everyone knows you're a virgin. <sighs> Better than being a man whore. Ain't that the truth. End of scene. Magical Realism Scene by Ratanak Kim. Characters are King Chan Ritchie, mid-twenties, rightful ruler of the crown, and General Moing, middle-aged, spiritualistic shaman who believes in law and order. The setting is Prasat, Cambodia, early 16th century, almost sunset. The king's army is advancing on them. At rise, they're on the ridge overlooking the landscape and their army camp. When I was a boy, my father told me that I'd never be king. Not because I was in his first born son, but because I don't understand the hearts of men. I never had an interest to get to know the people. I'm starting to believe that he has a point. Oh, Your Excellency, the late king was a very, very wise man, but he wasn't a soothsayer. He could not fathom this. Battle after battle, the usurper wins. Thousands of lives lost in vain. The people, my people, they cheer his name. Why do I even fight now? Your Highness, you fight because it's your rightful duty to rule. The gods support you. This I know. The gods? They seem to have forsaken me. The enemy is advancing on me with greater army. And you say the gods support me? <laughs> the gods have a funny way to show the support. My king, as long as there's life in you, there is hope. The legitimacy of the usurper claim to the throne will always be threatened as long as you're alive. The loss, the loss of a million lives will not be in vain as long as it secures your survival. I'm grateful for your optimism, General. But look at the men, they are fatigued. Their morale is low. The number of deserters grow each day. They have a small chance against Khan's army. I must do the right thing for once and admit defeat. We don't have any other choice. My lord, if you submit to the usurper, it'll be the end of you. He will never allow you to leave with your life. I know. My king. There is only one thing we can try. What is that, General? Many harvests ago, when I was but a young cub, I got lost in the jungle. There I met a hermit that had command over many living creatures in the jungle. He gave me refuge because the monsoon began. There I learned about the sacred arts of our people. After the end of the raining season, I returned home. My family thought I was dead, but that event birth my spiritual journey and what does this have to do with war my lord the hermit told me that our ancestors conquest was not any way won by military powers of, of the living an army of the dead can be raised under the authority of a true king my lord you are the true king you really believe this can be done yes my lord I can prepare the ritual before the fall of the last light. And in seven days, I'll return with the, with the sign of thunder at the fall of the last light. All I need is your consent. May the gods be with you.
the general exits. End of scene. Film inspired scene by Ratana Kim. The characters are Stuart, 16 years old, older brother of Dottie, 11 years old. And the setting is in their living room. The morning, it's present day. At rise, Dottie is on the couch watching TV, and Stuart is standing blocking her line of vision to the TV. Get out of my way! Can't you see I'm trying to watch TV? Why don't you go get something for breakfast? No, I'm not hungry. Now move! Breakfast is the most important meal of the day. It kickstarts your metabolism. It gives nutrition, nutrients, you know, to your brain. You got to have breakfast. No, I told you I'm not hungry. I am your boss. You have to listen to me. No, you're not my boss. I don't have to listen to you, dumbass. I am older than you. Mom put me in charge, making me your boss. And I have a lot of information that you don't have. That's about average. So I'm not dumb. And you have grandma's name. Shut up and get out of my way. Stuart snatches a remote. Don't that Grand Slam breakfast look good? Oh, that Carl's Jr. Western cheeseburger. Um, Go back to the channel I was watching, you nerd. How can I be dumb and be a nerd? Go get breakfast. Sassy. Just be you. No, put back my channel and get out of here. Go get breakfast. <sighs> he jumps up, walks past Stuart. Stuart flinches. He exits the scene and she grabs a granola bar and eats it. There. You happy? <laughs> yes. I told you I was the boss. He drops the remote onto the couch and exits. End of scene. Film inspired scene by Raymond Murillo. The characters are Superman. He's married to Superwoman. The setting is the state capital, Sacramento. All day, every day they show up for work. They're walking through the hallways to the house members to see the house members and senators. I understand, Senator, that criminal justice reform is not priority. It only seems to be the platform. When punishments are enhanced or new laws are created, House members, it starts here, lobbying to get votes from the people to change these disproportionate sentencing laws. We're superwoman. We need to be able to talk about our plans. We want to change the way people think about the laws created to lock away family members. I've been looking for you, Superman. Well, it doesn't really seem to be getting through to many people that members of Congress have superpowers. How do these people think a gun enhancement sentence of 10, 20 life is the right sentence? Basically, you use a gun and expect 10 years added to how many other years they've given you? It's crazy to me, Superman. It's, someone gets five years for shooting a gun where no one gets hurt. On top of the five years, they get 20 more years mandatory sentence for using the gun enhancement. Superwoman, what planet are we on? I read somewhere, land of the free, home of the brave. SB 620 is the bill that got passed 2017 to fix this more than 20 year old gun enhancement law, originating from the emotion of the tragic gun crime, people hurt people. 
not guns. This SB 620 just gives the judge the discretion to apply the gun enhancement or not, where the gun enhancement law was mandatory prior to SB 620. How about all the long-term offenders that have been in prison for over 10, 15, 20 years? Does this help them? No, it's not retroactive, meaning you have to serve all your time. There's no relief. It, how is that fair to anybody or change lives? All the states in the U.S. don't even have this gun enhancement law. Superwoman, we can't give up on people who are working for a second chance at life. Going away for so long in the prison system just creates a distant family member, like from another planet. The real mission of the criminal justice system should be to help people reintegrate that have been locked away. The rehabilitation part of CDCR applies to all these short-term offenders. The prison system creates programs for short-term offenders on level ones and two. It keeps long-term offenders on three and four yards. When the truth is long-term offenders, recidivism numbers are lower for long-term offenders. Everybody has a voice. I've been using my powers day and night. It takes more than me and Superman. We can change the world we live in if we know how our people are being treated. End of scene. Setting scene by Raymond Murillo. The character is a cement prison bed in ADSEG. Just another day in my prison cell, thinking about my life. Growing up, my thoughts were, what would I be? How would life turn out? I thought being a cement sidewalk would be all the life. All the people traveling over me to get to their destination. How happy people would be to walk over me. I could have been the first steps to a school, college, or the first steps outside the hospital. All those slabs of cement have happy memories, some sad too, but at least they're not always sad stories. I could have been the foundation to a home where a family lives and, and shares all the ups and downs of life. A home would have been nice. I could have grown up with generations of family instead of living a life where I could add to the happiness of people and the world. I was made into a cement bed in an isolated cold place called ADSEG. In a prison where the only people that sleep on me are full of sadness, hurt, and there's so many different stories to one's life. It's hard to ever be so happy in a place that was made to punish people. I'm a happy cement bed when, I'm, when my cell is cleared out. The people go back to general population. My happiness don't last long. Somebody new meets me sometimes in the same day. When will it stop? Magical Realism Scene by Stephen Sexton. The characters are Charlie B, 18-year-old, friend of Kenny P, 19-year-old. The setting is at the Super Bowl game. At Rise, the crowd is loud because the Chargers scored. Man, this game sucks, Kenny P. Looks good to me, my boy. Yeah, I guess so. I'm just a little bummed out. And why is that, Charlie? I've been having bad luck, bro. That's all. Well, bad luck is better than no luck. Yeah, I mean, I lost my wallet yesterday, and now my car won't start, bro. Well, look at it on the good side, my brother. You woke up today, and we're at the Super Bowl game. Yeah, I mean, I guess it might change some of my attitude, but I don't, I don't know. Now, there you go, shortchanging your attitude about things. Say, hey, let's go get something to eat, man. 
Now you're talking good, my boy. There's uh one more thing, Kenny P. One more thing. Yeah, what's that, my brother? <laughs> I would buy, but like I said, I lost my wallet, bro. Oh, man. Don't worry. I got it, my brother. Hey, thanks, buddy. End of scene. Here comes Richard again by Stephen Sexton. The characters are Richard, 12-year-old boy, and Trey Shot, an older man. The setting is at the neighborhood park at Rise. Richard is walking in the park. What's up with you old bombs? Ain't no bombs over here, Justin. Girl, oh, yeah? Oh, yeah? At 10 o'clock in the morning, dude, a low job or school. <laughs> yeah, we all in public relations, little man. Why you up here? Okay, so where do you work at then? <laughs> where I work at? Okay, so where I work at? I thought I told you, we in public relations. Yeah, like, I know what that is. You probably don't even know yourself. Killing me this morning, little man, with this stuff. Like I said, big fella, it's about time all y'all get your life right. Yeah, and what about you, little man? I'm watching all y'all for some of my answers and, and what not to do, player. Well, little man, you might be right today, but what about all those tomorrows? I'm a kid up here. I'm trying to figure out this world I'm in. And all I have to look at is you guys. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you, I ain't no role model. Maybe one of them are. Now, now see, that's what I'm talking about. Don't none of you older guys want to step up and learn nothing. Man, I'm a born leader, my little brother of the world. Not up at the park, as old as you are. Hanging out. How old are you, man? Why, you the police or something, little dude? Man, you need to get your life together before it's too late. What is what is that supposed to mean? Huh, little man? Just because we here don't mean we some bombs. End of scene. Magical realism scene by Carlos Vasquez. The characters are Jack, an older man, and Ray, Jack's younger brother. Setting is 2020 Washington, D.C., the apartment they share, daytime. At Rise, Ray and Jack are looking out a window down at the street, 10 stories down. Look at all those young, inspired men and women, all racist, protesting. Man, you crazy, Jack. These delinquents, hey man, they're down there wreaking havoc in the streets, tripping. If you want to change the world, pick up your pen and write. Man, what are you talking about? That's what the great MLK said. Those words changed my life. <laughs> Since when? <laughs> Since the start of this pandemic. Since we all witnessed George Floyd murder in the street. Since the Black Lives Matter movement started. Is that why you've been writing all them letters lately? Man, you off your rocker, old man. You tripping. I won't stop until I have written every single family that has lost a loved one to the senseless killing by a police officer. Man, that is impossible. You're just wasting your time. Those letters ain't going to change nothing. You might be right, Ray. But at the very least, writing these letters, it helps me. I mean, how can a stinking letter help you with your problems? Well, with all this stuff going on in the world, I've been feeling 
the need to help in some way. Obviously, I ain't the young whippersnapper I used to be. So I physically, I ain't much use. I was struggling with the feeling of being helpless until I saw MLK. His words inspired me, man, to take action and change the world with my pen. Man, you a nut. Look, love you too, brother. End of scene. Magical realism masks monologue. The character is Erica. Oh gosh, I hate talking about myself. Really. I have nothing to say. I mean, what does a painfully shy teenager with a big nose do in this world? I don't feel I belong anywhere. Well, maybe in the future I can muster enough courage to be an actress. I've always dreamed of being an actress like Lucille Ball. <laughs> Knowing me, I'll probably end up being like Lucy in the show and not the real Lucille Ball, you know? <laughs> Always trying to be in a show with absolutely no talent, you know? Oh God. I hate my life. Improv Scene by Carlos Vasquez. Characters are Paul, a uh, middle-aged man uh, and Mark, a middle-aged friend of Mark and his roommate. Setting is the home that they share in the garage present day. At rise, Paul walks into the garage to see Mark building an unusual object. Mark, what are you doing? Building a time machine. I want to ask why, if you spend half your time on your projects, on your homework, you would have graduated by now. Yes, and if you stop talking, if you stop bothering me and spent your time looking for a job, you could get your own place. Okay, so I've changed my mind. About? Why the heck are you building? A time machine. Why the heck wouldn't I build a time machine? <laughs> Where are you going to go to? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe I can go back to the Stone Age and see what, what it was like. Yeah. And alter the entire world as we know it while you're at it. You're so dramatic, Paul. Yes. And I wouldn't be as dramatic if you would stop trying to build another one of your crazy projects. My projects are going to get us rich. Then we won't have to worry about graduating or getting a job. Yeah. And the only thing that we'll have to worry about is the government looking us up and taking your time machine. Well, why would they do that? Why wouldn't they do that? End of scene. Comedy scene by Kawan Williams. The characters yeah. are Tufa, 38-year-old male, and Amy, 33-year-old female. The setting is a coffee shop. Amy is drinking her coffee, collecting her thoughts. Tufa walks in and sees Amy. Look at that. Woo-wee. Thank you, Father God. You have been merciful to me. Can I say amen? Whew. He starts walking toward Amy. Is he looking? Oh, I hope not. Oh. oh, no. Oh, no. He's walking over here. All right, just look away. Yes. Yeah, look away. Maybe he'll keep walking. 
Um, what it do, baby girl? My name is Too Fine. And uh, I got time to make you mine. Well, I don't got time. Maybe some other time. Rain check. Ain't no rain check here, girl. What you talking about? And um, you ain't even finished your coffee. He sits himself down at the table. He's not a bright one. You know, it's a bright one out here. Uh, I told you, there ain't no rain. Oh, yeah. Right. No rain. What's your name, baby girl? I don't get it. Um, and don't tell me that Mag Trainer stuff. You know, my name is, you know, Megan Trainer. Meg. Who? Okay. Never mind. Never yeah. Mind. You know, Megan Trainer, the singer that sings the, uh, the song something about no baby girl, I need a yes. I'm too fine, baby. And you just too fine. You got to be mine. If I tell you my name, can we finish this conversation some other time? You haven't finished your coffee. We got to take time. And what's the rush anyways? Ain't you tired? Because you've been running through my mind all day. 90s. We are in the 90s. Look, my name is Amy. Are you happy now? Calm down, baby. I just want to get to know you. Ain't no need to be mean. I'm your man. I'm here for you. We're, you know, we were long lost souls who have finally found their way back. I mean, back to each other. And now we are found. Amen. Look, sir, I don't know about all that, but you're not my type. You look like, you look like you live with your mama. I have no job and have no plans on getting one. Damn, girl. You hit that right on the money. How you know that? I can see that we already understand each other. You exactly what I'm looking for. A woman who understand my situation. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Yes. Get that out of your head. We don't part. understand each other. We're, we're, we're understandings apart, worlds apart. We will never. Come on, baby girl. I'm too fine. I'm God's gift to women. I'm your gift, personally. You can untie me. Untie me, baby girl, untie me. I'm gonna finish my coffee, okay? Gotta go. She throws her coffee away and walks away. End of scene. <laughs> Comedia scene by Kawan Williams. The character is the Dottore. I am real hungry and this pizza smells real good. <laughs> he opens the box of pizza to look at it. Oh boy, you look real good to me. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they wouldn't mind if I took a slice. He takes one slice, then continues on the delivery of the pizza. Mmm, mmm, mmm. All this walking that I'm doing, I think I deserve to have another. Yay! Mm. Well, I can tell them that the walking may, may, be, may be hungry, so I'm sure that, that, they, that they wouldn't mind. <laughs> oh, that really hit the spot. Uh, before he knows why not it, another before he knows it he delivers a box without a pizza autumn inspired scene by Diego Cruz 
the characters are a shining quarter wanting to grant a wish and the wishing well all alone. The setting is the nearby park at night. At rise, Shining Quarter rolls up to the wishing well. Oh, no way, no way. I found it. A wishing well. Uh, who is talking near me at this time of hour? Nobody walks, runs, or jogs at this hour. <gasps> wishing well, I found you. I have been in need of you. I want to be granted a wish. I only need you for it to work. How does this all work? Weird. It's only you, no human wanting the wish. It's only you, quarter. I must ask, what is it you are wishing for? Then I'll tell you the steps. I want to be worth more, have more value. I do think I'm not worthy of anything. Wow. Truly, this has been bothering you for a while, and you desire this more than anything. I might be able to help. Yes, wishing well. Yes, you understand. Quarter, start rolling closer and closer to the edges. Do you see the water? Close your eyes and speak from the heart and do a 360 backflip, back tail, head first somersault. What? I can't do that. I haven't even heard of that move. I mean, what? I'm so confused. Is it, is this a test? I, I, I even forget how the moves go. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, that's the price for the wish to come true. Plus, I think it would look awesome. <laughs> come on, do it. <laughs> I think I can value myself in another way. Therapy seems to be a really good option right now. Okay, Quarter, your choice. But if it doesn't work, give me a call or something. I'll be waiting here for that summer, so. <laughs> Crazy, Quarter. End of scene. Setting scene by Carlos Villarraos. The characters are Day Room during the World Series and Mateo. The setting is the Day Room at night. It's opening up and Mateo has a phone. He's flickering his lights to come out to the, oh, at rise, Mateo is flickering his lights to come out to the Day Room. Damn Mateo. When was the last time you seen the Dodgers in the World Series? If I'm not mistaken, in 88 or 89. Wow. That's a very long time ago. Hey, why aren't you coming out? I have a phone call at 7.30 PM. You know I'm going to be really loud in your conversation may be unpleasant. Yes, I know, but hearing my family's voice is, is what motivates me. Well, good luck with that. And to think that you might miss some really good plays. Yeah, but family's more important than a World Series. You're absolutely right, Mateo. I know I am. Good luck, Mateo. Thank you. It's so open up. My phone is coming up. End of scene. Autumn inspired scene by Steve Sexton. The characters are Rain, 23, male, and Wynn, 22, female, girlfriend of Rain. The setting is outside in the streets. At rise, everything is out of control. Say when, what's good? Why are you blowing everything you come across? So I'm, st I'm still with you. So what you saying back talk to mama? Well, I know that my love, it's just that I wish you would settle down. 
And yeah, do what? Get rained on you every fall and winter? Girl, that's the sweet part about us. I'm all over you. Yeah, well, I'm about to blow this tree down so we can have a seat. Well, that's better. So I can cry on your shoulder. Hold up. Crying for what? I just love us being together. Is that so much of a crime? Well, since you put it that way, I guess we can see the sun come up. Now that's what I'm talking about, my windmill. I'm calming down now, my rainbow shine. End of scene. Object Scene by Carlos Villarraos. The characters are a TV that's been in the family living room for years and a radio that the family barely placed in the living room. The setting is the family living room in the afternoon at rise. The TV's wondering how come no one is watching him. Welcome to the living radio. I've been here for years. Well, thank you for the warm welcome, TV. No problems. Once the kids finish their homework, they come in here to watch me until dinner. Well then, I'm gonna just sit here and just uh, pick up dust. Don't worry, maybe during the holidays and parties, you'll have no rest. Look, look, here come all the kids now. So I'll talk to you tomorrow, radio. No, wait, why is anyone turning me on like always? Sorry, TV, times have changed. And with that, people change. Everyone listens to music now. All these years, I've entertained the family? Yes, but music is what is in. So for now, you must just sit, be patient till your time comes back again. Thank you for your words of comfort, radio. Sorry for acting so self-centered. No problem, TV. Just remember us. Appliances have to stick together. After all, we're made to entertain, right? End of scene. <laughs> Object Monologue by Carlos Villarraos. I am the object that always brings a party to life. I am the one who will remind you of all the memories you have made throughout your life. I am something that'll make you forget all of your problems once you turn me on. With me in your life, you'll never have a dull moment as long as you turn me on, play your favorite music. Remember, batteries not included. Monologue by Rodolfo. I am a gray Nike shirt. At first, I sit in the store. Then with a little bit of luck, I get bought. My fear is to sit in the store for a very long time. But most of the time, I'm in gyms or playing sports. So I could say I live a good life most of the time until I get ripped. Then they throw me in the trash. That's when my life ends. End of monologue. This is a comedy scene by Daniel Lee Foreman. We have Benito, a teenage bull. We have Kenneth, a silver haired, wizened old shopkeeper. It's early afternoon inside of a downtown China shop. We see Kenneth sitting behind the shop counter reading a newspaper. We hear the door chime as someone enters. Can I help you? Um, yeah, I was wondering, um, what is it? As you can see, I'm super busy at the moment. Well, um, I was just wondering, sir, 
Is it Mandarin or Cantonese? Mandarin or what the hell? Ha! Ah! Well, sir, I'm only asking because I've never tried to learn another language before. And 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 what pray tell does that have to do with me? Well, sir. Well, you see, the thing is, um what? What? Spit it out already. Well, sir, I had heard Mandarin was easier to learn, so. What, learn? Are you kidding me? Is this kind of, some kind of joke? Am I being punked? Where's Ashton Kutcher at? Sir, please don't yell at me. The sign on the front of your store says, China shop, and I plan on visiting China soon, so. Are, are, are you stupid? Sir. Please don't say that. I don't want to lose my temper. Lose your temper? Lose your temper? You're an idiot. If, if this, <laughs> you're an idiot asking if this is a school for language learning. You moron. Sir, I'm warning you, be polite. Polite? Get out. Get out of here before you, before you break something. Oh yeah, you're for sure getting a bad, a bad Yelp review from me, sir. As he spins quickly to leave, he crashes into a delivery guy, dropping and shattering his delivery. Oh no, my beachy dishes. Oh. So is it too late to get my pack parking slip validated? End of scene. This is a scene inspired by an object written by Daniel Lee Foreman. Cell Dawn is a cold, lonely prison cell. Maddie is a lumpy old prison mattress. They're in the Pelican Bay prison in the middle of the night. Maddie is lying on a metal bunk, smirking at Seldon. That's why I can't stand talking to you, Maddie. You don't feel any guilt over the pain you cause and- And, and why should I, Seldon? You have some grand desire to, to be the catalyst of change in their lives. Yet I'm the one changed by all of those lost causes. Lost causes? They're not lost causes, they're people with feelings and hopes and dreams. And yeah, I like to believe I'm responsible for helping them grow. Why are you so against that? Why, why, why? why? <laughs> do, do you remember when you and I first met Selly? I was young, unblemished and full of hope, pride and, and fluff. But with every one of your beloved people doing their best to crush me beneath the weight of their problems, I've grown jaded. Do you not see the difference you made in all those lives you touch? With your once warm, welcome cushion comfort? Doesn't that feel good? You're delusional, Selden. Nobody's given me a second thought as they crushed, crushed me, crunched me, smashed me, tore me peed on me, split on me, spit on me, drooled on me, stuffed, stuffed, stuffed inside of me. No one of that, none of that made me feel good. I just don't see why you've grown so hard and unyielding, Matt. So you've been through some hard times, big deal. You realize that people we meet are just the first domino in a long line of suffering. Those people you detest so fervently made mistakes and society chose to throw them away for it. But they're not the only ones suffering. Oh yeah, who else is, so, is suffering, Sally? No, Maddie. They're, they're, they're connects? No, no, Maddie. How about their children without their father to help raise them? Or their wives without their partner and a spouse to help or countless other lives, their absence ruins. I'm used to feeling alone, but it still hurts. 
So how do you think these people feel knowing how alone their children and loved ones feel without them? I never thought about it like that before, Selden. I, I feel like a real soiled linen. Just change, Maddie. Be better. That's all any of us can do. No matter the situation we find ourselves in physically, only we control where we are mentally. Mm. You know, beneath all the gloom of your cold facade, the walls of gold. Thanks for the talk. End of scene. Yeah. Flight of the Carrot by Daniel Lee Foreman. The character is Professor Don Taro. Today, I would like to talk to you about the plight of the carrot. For decades now, we've been told we should eat carrots because they are good for our eyesight. And many top experts have correctly pointed out the fact that one seldom, if ever, sees a rabbit wearing glasses. While I do not deny these as of yet uncontested assertions, I do wish to point out that I, myself, have eaten carrots my entire life, yet still I am cursed with poor eyesight. That being an indisputable fact, perfectly illustrated by the bifocals upon my face, we must consider another possibility, that somebody has a grudge against our orange-skinned brethren. After countless hours of research into the matter, I can tell you with absolute certainty that there's a guaranteed possibility that the culprit responsible may be, and in fact, very well could be someone other than the carrots themselves. So in summation, ladies and gentlemen, we can be absolutely certain the carrots may or may not be good for us. End of monologue. I am a day room by Rodolfo. I am a day room. Lots of people pass through me, so I'm never alone. Sometimes all I want to do is rest. But I can't rest during the day because I'm a day room. I have to wait till night. I'm fine with that because people have fun with me. So I can't complain. End of monologue. A film inspired scene by Robert Smith. Hondo, age 45, is captain of the squad. Street, age 30, is understudy of the captain. We're in the locker room of the SWAT training center, clock out time. Street is tying his shoes, looking over at Hondo, and Hondo is putting on his shirt. You did a good job out there today, Street. Yeah, but it was a close one. I thought I lost him for a minute. I saw that. What happened? Seemed like you were uh, in outer space. I was. It brought back a lot of memories. I thought I had worked through all of that. Memories? Yeah, I had to have therapy when I was eight. My father killed my mother in the same way as that guy today that had the knife. My sister and I 
we had to have therapy and uh, well into our high school years. I would have never known. You seem so well put together. It's a trip how PTSD can still affect you. Maybe you should go see Mary, uh, the team counselor. She helps me a lot. Helps you? Yeah, coming back from the war, I'm still dealing with that. I hear things, I see things all the time. And like you, I freeze up sometimes. I, I thought I was over it. But, but the scene today is like I was eight years old. Back home in the kitchen, like it was happening all over again. Look, Street, we might think we got it together, but PTSD doesn't leave. It's like a drug addiction. We are addicted for life. We need counseling to help us work through it for life. I would have never known it. You look solid when we're out there. I thought I was over it. We never get over it. We just get on with it. Maybe I'll go. You should. End of scene. A scene inspired by improv by Robert Ishmael Smith. Peter, one, is a field worker. Peter, two, is also a field worker. We're on the farm in the field of vegetables midday. Two cousins sitting on the back of a work truck eating lunch. Look, bro, I think El Jefe is talking about letting you go. Letting me go where? I ain't asked for no vacation. <laughs> vacation? That's what you think? Your whole job act is a vacation. He's talking about firing you. Why? I, I get it done. No, you don't. You eat more pumpkins than you pick. That's probably why you can't keep a woman. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Hard Worker. Everybody can't work as hard as you. I'm not saying be me, Pete. I'm saying put more effort into your job and you'll get better results. Oh man, you work too hard. They can't even count the, the pecs that you pick each day. This ain't about me, Pete. This is about you. Your job is on the line. Why is y'all so focused on me? I pick as many pumpkins as you pick peppers. Yeah, I don't think it's about how many pumpkins you pick. It's about how many pumpkins you eat. It's making you lazy. Well, what's wrong with eating pumpkins? It's not as good, as good as the pepper, and it's not just the boss that don't like it. The ladies don't like it too much either. It makes your breath stink. Oh, I ain't gonna start eating peppers. That's, that's your preference. And besides, pumpkins make a good pie. You, Georgie, Tom, y'all got it bad. You don't know what to do with pumpkin pies or the ladies, you, you should try something new. No, I quit. I ain't made for this field work anyway. Good, hey Pete, Black Lives Matter. End of scene. A scene inspired by magical realism by Robert Ishmael Smith. Destiny is a young girl. She's 12 years old. Justice is a young boy, 11 years old. They're in a wooded area in the middle of Kentucky, early afternoon. Both are walking, hitting at the leaves on the ground with sticks and talking. I don't know why my dad can't come home. I miss him. I like your dad. He's funny. At least you have a dad. Why do we always have to go to war? I don't understand why we go to war all the time. What is Al Qaeda? My mom said they're bad people. I don't know. My mom said that they attacked the New York City towers. They're in Arabia or somewhere. I wish we could all be at peace. No more war anywhere. Me too. What's that? She bends down to pick up a, a metallic stone. 
Wow, it's really shiny. Is it a diamond? No, silly. It's like a metal rock. I feel weird. Look, it's, it's glowing. Oh, I feel like, like I'm connected to it. Shh, shh. Do you hear that? What? 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 What is it? A voice. It says, make a wish? The, the wish, that's make a wish. Hurry, hurry. What, what should I wish for? So much trouble in the world? So much sadness? Hurry up, Das, just wish, make a wish. Okay, okay. I wish for a PlayStation 5. End of scene. A scene inspired from film. Karen is 32, an FBI detective. Smiling is a serial killer. Karen is at his home. I'm pleased to make your acquaintance. Hmm. The pleasure is mine, and I'm sure you'd like to get straight to business. Quite punctual, you. Quite punctual. Yes, indeed. But what of the word itself? Punctual, pun, punching, puncture, or punting a football? In you, I think the latter is invoked. This is no game, so take the big smile down a notch, huh? I don't know what you're about, and I'm not scared of you. Do you feed on fear or something? Fear? <laughs> fear of what? And what on earth are you talking about? I've heard this old house is haunted. Have you seen a ghost or something? Explain. No ghost, old man, but none of us live forever. If you like to believe in ghosts, go ahead. You're a vicious serial killer who will someday be just another ghost like Jack the Ripper or the hollow nickel killer. Spent. Are you scared to die? Fear of dying? Spent? Well, if I'm going to be spent, I guess I'll have to be sure they buy something worth spending myself on. No. So you are scared of dying. You didn't even refuse the killer accusation, just went straight to fear and death. Well, I know what you are. Even if I don't have the proof of service or, or 20 box tops from the cereal box to send in for proof of purchase for my little prize for a toy. She pulls her gun on him. End of scene. And now we have a monologue, I Am a Song, by Paul Kaiser. I am a song, a play in your ear. Sometimes I dance as a vibration in your heart. I tell you a story, or sometimes I may ask your memories to tell me one. <laughs> I am a song, but I am so much more. I'll be something you'll listen to even as you walk through the door, you walk through to the outside of life's door. I am a song, even to the deaf or the blind. I bring color to the mind. I am a song, and if I'm good, I do no wrong. A comedy scene by Paul Kaiser. Rusty, a spoon that is rusty, middle-aged. Bentley, a fork that is bent, older. They're lying on a towel next to a sink, just washed, now drying. They're lying there as if sunbathing next to each other. Hey, Bentley, one of these days, I'm gonna be uh, 
pushing myself deep down into a bowl of the finest ice cream after having just had the most expensive cake. No, you won't, boy. You crazy, man. You have been up on eating sweets, youngin. Who thinks you got it all? But you really just a rusty spoon. It only gets used for cleaning out the garbage disposal. What? <laughs> no, I'm not. Hell, you can almost see your reflection in the top of me, of my handle. You bent up old geezer, fork. If you bother to look, you just jealous because because I'm not bent like you. And only you only get used as a screwdriver when the cabinet drawer gets loose. Look who's talking. You just laying up in the back of that cabinet when they saw you back there after fixing those loose screws in the in in the in the fridge with me. Yeah, I'm I'm helpful. I do stuff around here. Ha, huh, what? What you do stuff around here? The the day they used me to clean out the garbage disposal, I was doing something. Uh, when they found old bit up you down there, stopping up the disposal and threw you up into the cabinet and forgot you. Well, hell, who's so clumsy that they drop a fork in the disposal anyhow? And they're so lazy to just throw me up in the cabinet with a screen there, too lazy to change, or with a real screwdriver instead of a fork anyhow. Uh, you're right, my old friend. And who's so clumsy to use a spoon to clean a fork out of the garbage disposal? And then leave me around wet long enough to rust up like this besides. Yep, my young partner. But here we are, the both of us, just washed up all clean. They even used Dawn. This show, it cuts the grease, you know? Just laying here, all sparkly and dry on the towel. Feels just like a, a, a newborn baby. Yeah, it does, my good friend. Heck, I'm glad you fill it in the disposal. <laughs> now, yeah, you would be. <laughs> I'm glad to kind of think of it. If they dry this off, then what are we doing laying here on the towel drying anyhow? Yeah, what's up with that? Let's bust out of here, little buddy. Next time that garbage disposal opens up, let's just get gone. I'll see you there. <laughs> In my reflection, of course. Of course. End of scene. A scene inspired by improv by Philip Alexander. Ashanti is a 63-year-old woman. She is friends with Natasha, who is a 65-year-old woman. It is the mid-afternoon. They are at the park, sitting on the park bench talking. Ashanti is fumbling with a cell phone in her hand while Natasha laughs frantically. Oh my goodness. I don't know why they call these darn things smartphones. There's nothing smart about them. If the phone's smart, then what do you call the operator? <laughs> An idiot for buying something called smart, yet so stupid. Oh, I think this thing is broken. Maybe it's not broken. It just has a mind of its own. I heard those things can read your mind if you stare at it long enough. <laughs> uh, how long am I supposed to do this? I think uh, long enough is frying my brain. I was kidding, Ashanti. <laughs> I can't believe me. I don't know how to work that gadget. <laughs> well, maybe I should call Inspector Gadget. Seems like the right thing to do in this situation. I do have this instruction manual. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, does it say how to work UPOs? Uh, UPO, what's that? Oh, don't tell me that's what I think it is. What do you think a UPO is? 
I would guess it's under pressure, obviously. What else could it mean? Uh, no. <laughs> that's, that's not what I meant at all, but that's a good one. Mm. I was saying unidentified phone object. Mm. Oh. Oh, it, it says here to download the app. What's an app? You mean, do you mean Apple? My day would be better with an Apple. My daughter said this was an Apple phone, more like a space phone. Mm. Oh, one thing for sure. I've been wondering, can this godforsaken thing fly? I don't know what an app is. I think you may be right about that space phone. What's that light on the back? Mm. I think that thing's about to take flight. Oh, uh, says here, it's a flashlight. Well, see if it can flash some light on this situation. Ha ha ha. End of scene. A genre scene. This one is romantic comedy by Philip Alexander. Isabella is a 24 year old woman and Carl is a 23 year old man. They are boyfriend and girlfriend. It's a Friday evening at 730 and Isabella's dance aerobics class at the gym. Isabella is stretching when Carl walks into her class from the locker room dressed like he's ready for basketball. She looks up surprised. What are you doing here? What are you wearing, Carl? You look ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> well, you said I've been working too hard and not spending time with you. Well, here I am spending time. I appreciate the gesture, but I don't think this is the time or place for spending time, for spending time or for that outfit. <laughs> this is not the place for basketball, Mr. Headband. Why not? What's wrong with working out together? Don't be a hater. I'm dressed to sweat. <laughs> okay, Globetrotter. <laughs> and this is this is not a workout for you. Trust me on this. You don't want to get involved in this workout. If it's good enough for you, then I'm all in. Hmm. So, if you can do it, I can do it. Oh, really? <laughs> so, no matter what, you're going to do the workout? You promise? Scout Sana, I'll do you one better. If I can't keep up with you, wherever you want to go to have dinner after class, I'll take you. Well, it's funny you say that because I've been craving some uh, steak and lobster all day. So keep up, babe. This is a twerking class. End of scene. This genre scene is a comedy with the same starting line by Philip Alexander. Sharon is a 62 year old woman, mother of Christopher. Christopher is 21 years old and they're standing in the living room of the family's home on a mid afternoon. Sharon and Christopher are embracing one another, crying after Christopher just hung up the phone. <laughs> what, what did they say? Who was that? What did they say happened to Karen? I don't know, Mom. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Karen's friend, Kim, said she was injured and she didn't know if she would. <laughs> she didn't know if she would what? What did she say happened? 
<laughs> I'm not sure, but Kim answered Karen's phone and, and, and I figured it had to be serious since, since Karen never lets anyone use her phone. And then Karen was whispering like she couldn't talk. Then I heard someone in the background say, you can't be on your phone in here. So I panicked. <laughs> then why did you say Karen was injured? If you're not sure what's going on. I just told you, Mom, Karen never lets anyone use her phone. So I figured she had to be injured if Kim's answering. Duh, Mom. Well, call her back and see what's going on. Duh, son. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, Kim? What happened to Karen? Oh, okay. Not injury? Oh, okay. Injury duty. I'll, I'll tell mom. End of scene. A monologue by Tony. I am a pen. But besides just being a pen, I am your enabler, your voice, one who bleeds out your inner thoughts. Others see me as just a pen. But I can assure you that the wise have quoted, I am mightier than the sword. <laughs> so, for thee who wants to wield me, think wisely, for I cannot be blamed. End of monologue. Scene from an object by Tony. We have Bic, a Bic pen, and number two, a chewed up number two pencil. We're at Russell Elementary, classroom number two. 6.30 a.m. Bic and number two are on top of Mrs. M's desk. Psst. Psst. Hey, you. Can you help me? Can you tell me where I am? Hey. Yes, you. The oddly shaped one. Don't you judge me. Give it a couple of minutes and you're going to look like me. What do you mean look like you? Where am I? Yes. I once had that new look with a full set of eraser, brightly yellow with no dents, and that was yesterday. Full set of eraser? You, you hardly got anything on that, that, that chewed up chrome half of yours. Exactly my point. These kids will chew you up and spit you out like they're boogers. Uh, 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 where am I? Kindergarten. Oh, yeah. Let's see how you look by the end of the day. No, 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 no. I will roll myself off and out of this room before those kids show up. Well, you better get moving because school is in session. I will not be a chew toy. Tell that to the kid that is reaching for you. <laughs> end of scene. I Am A Story by Ratanat Kim. I am everywhere. People talk about me all the time. Sometimes they lie. Sometimes they can be truth. Sometimes I am created from sheer fantasy. I can be simple. I can be complex. I can be happy. I can be sad. I can be meaningful. I can be a waste of time. I can represent it as art. Songs are made about me. I am written into stone. I'm made into books. I am depicted in movies. I am expressed in theaters. I am important because I live in everyone and everything. I am a story. Tell people about me. End of monologue.
This is a monologue by Manu Kale Kale. The character is Mrs. Potato Head. I know Mr. Potato Head knows I hid his ears. What's he need them for? He don't listen to nothing. No one has to say anyways. If I told him once, I told him twice. Take your ears off before you go to bed. I mean, they're detachable for crying out loud. It's not like you need your ears while you're asleep. But does he listen? No. I swear, if he forgot it's our anniversary today, I'm going to hide the rest of him tomorrow. I wonder how much longer Mr. Potato Head is going to continue yelling until he realizes his ears are in the freezer. <laughs> End of monologue. Magical Realism Scene by Joseph Monroy. The characters are Stone, 16-year-old male, and Mary Jane, his 20-year-old sister. The setting is at home in the evening. At Rise, Stone and Mary Jane are having a conversation. I can't believe he is finally coming home. Yeah, I'm anxious and happy for him to be here already. I'm still nervous. To actually get to finally hang out and really get to know dad. What? But you guys talk all the time. We've been to visit him so much. Why? That's our dad. He loves us. Well, I see how some of my friends get along with their dads. Also, it's some who fight all the time. I'm hoping he is not mean to us. He is getting out of a crazy place. Stone, what's wrong with you? He's a good dad. We both missed him for a large part of our lives, but I think I know him enough to know he's a good dad. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I'm just tripping, I guess. Like he has always given me good advice since I was a kid. I just, I just want him to like me. It's just, we never actually, I can't ever remember how it is to hang out with dad. You guys always said nice, just so much good stuff about him. It's just he has been in that place so long. Plus, he does look mean, don't you think? <laughs> he does, but th that's just his face. <laughs> I remember how he would defend me from the bigger kids and take us to the park and play ball with us. And he would, all of a sudden, as we were playing, say, who wants ice cream? And then we all jump in the truck and go to McDonald's. Well, I'm not a little boy anymore. I don't think he's going to be so playful. End of scene. This is a monologue by Joseph Monroy. The character's name is Rob. Hi, my name is Rob. I'm usually on the go, active. I look serious, but I'm quick to smile. <laughs> I'm optimistic. So I'm looking forward to this virus passing like all others in human history. Of course, I'm a, a realist that eventually one day, it'll be something to, to reduce the numbers again. All life on this planet, planet is meant to be recycled back to our great, big, beautiful planet. Um, we outnumber all living creatures and are just growing, growing up in population. It is what it is. I mean, some will live, some will die. My family has taken losses too. If God's willing, so be it. We must continue to live righteously and respectively of each other. End of monologue. A genre scene, this is a comedy scene um, by Raymond Reyes. The characters are mom, 58 years old woman, um, and April, 35 year old, her daughter. 
the setting is inside a studio apartment um, at Rise. Mom is rummaging in her apartment, searching for her glasses, which are on her head. Oh, where are my glasses? Dang it. Looking around the apartment. Where did you leave them? I left them right here. Points nowhere specifically. Mom, mom, stop. Where did you leave your glasses, lady? <laughs> and you wonder why your grandson calls you a crazy lady. Doggone it. Where did you put them, April? Stop playing with me. Where are my glasses? Check the top of your head, mom. <laughs> Gosh darn it, April. Ugh. <sighs> I love you, lady. <laughs> End of scene. The genre scene um, by Raymond Reyes. This is a drama version. Um, characters are mom, 58-year-old woman, and April, her 33-year-old daughter. Setting is inside the studio apartment, and mom is rummaging through her apartment searching for her glasses. Oh, where are my glasses? Dang it. Oh. I don't know, mom. Where did you leave them? I left them right there. Where did you leave your glasses, mom? Oh. Stop, mom. Crazy lady. Oh, it. Stop playing with me, April. Where are my glasses? Give them to me already. On top of your head, Mom. Light fades to black. Autumn inspired scene by Tehran. Rita is 32 and her boyfriend is 38. They are home, it's 5 p.m. on a Friday. Rita is in the kitchen cooking chicken. Hey baby, is that you? I'm in the kitchen. Yes, yeah, me, I'm finally home. What's that smelling good? I'm frying Ooh. chicken and baking an apple pie for you, love. <laughs> Man, I can't wait to taste that. I'm hungry. Plus, we need to discuss the doctor's visit. I know, baby. It's a lot to take in, and I'm scared. Me too. I would be lying if I said I wasn't scared. Scared as hell. And you know how I feel about any type of surgery, babe. I know, baby, but... I really want to have a baby with you. And I need to go through with this operation so we can extend our family. I know, baby. I want it just as bad as you, as you do as well. I love you too, but I love you so much that the thought of you possibly dying, it scares me. I don't want to lose you. Me neither, baby. But it's a small risk I'm willing to take for the love of my life. Babe, I know. I know this, but don't. I can't picture myself living the rest of my life without my soulmate. I love you, baby. Let's, let's just enjoy this meal. Love you too, babe. Let's agree to finish this tomorrow. End of scene. Now we have a monologue inspired by Comedia del Arte by the talented Tehran. We have Professor Chatterbox and the philosophy of eating chicken wings. <laughs> You first need to get to the right fast food place to purchase your chicken. There are many options to choose from. Churches is cool, but the chicken there is extremely filled with grease. El Polo Loco 
has good chicken as well. Most especially if you prefer it grilled. But for me, it is too dry. Popeye's chicken, oh, is tasty. Ooh, it is well seasoned. Uh, KFC has great chicken with a nice variety to choose from. Now, my own personal preference is Louisiana fried chicken. Oh, the pieces are seasoned with uh, well with, uh, oh, and the meat oh, is very tender. And the skin is seasoned with the right amount of spices. It's deliciously crunchy. Oh, when it comes to eating the piece, I like to be cerebral. When I do make sure every morsel of white meat and brown skin, I bite off the bone. I like to start not in the center, no, like most people, but at the part where the gristle is and work my way towards the center, <laughs> taking the wing apart. <laughs> End of monologue. A scene inspired by improv, we have Patas and Pepe, and is by the talented Tehran. Pepe, why, why are they throwing around the ball? That's the object of the game. And now to advance it, Patas. Yeah, and I, I thought it was the, the sport of football, not him throw ball. It's American football. Yes and it's got the wrong name, it's confusing. Once you understand the rules, it's not that confusing, Patas. Yes, and when they actually use their feet to kick the ball in this American football, Pepe? They start the game with the kickoff and after half time as well. Yes, and is that it, seriously? No, after each score, they kick the ball. If they don't get a first down in three plays, they do a kick known as a punt. Yes. And it's way more confusing now more than ever. More we watch, I'll explain, and you'll understand. Yes. And I still don't know how you can call this sport football. I prefer the real football known as American soccer. End of scene. And now a monologue by Michael Monson. I am time. I am undescribable. I am lonely. I have no peers or equals. I watch and watch and watch. I have no idea how I came to be or when I will end. I permeate everything, seen and unseen. I am there for the beginning and ending of all there is. I obscure humanity, hoping one of its kind. Can you understand me and interact with me in the most intimate way. I am the measure of all things. A scene by Michael Monson. We have time and fire. The setting is in the nothing before the Big Bang. At rise, an explosion in which time realizes he is moving forward. Fire. I'm pleased, to see who, I'm pleased to see you have others of your kind. Have you seen any of mine? I'm sorry, Tom. You are the only one there is or ever will be of your kind. Mm -hmm. Just all things comforted, comforted with a companion? Yes. But you are extraordinary and beautifully important. The universe 
would never be able to support or create another of your kind. What is my purpose? What comfort can I hope for? Your purpose is to be everywhere for everything. You can comfort yourself with knowing no one event, person, or thing could ever exist without you. But what if I tire of that task? Will anyone else release me from, from my loneliness? <laughs> that I cannot say. There is a special creature known by the name of man that offers you the best hope of understanding you enough to communicate with you to answer the questions you ponder. I have seen this creature and his kind come to be from almost nothing and evolve into the beautiful complex creature it is now. How do you know this creature offers my best chance to understand me? I live in each and every one of them, just like you live in me and understand me and how I came to be. So it is that I understand him and the direction he travels upon. I cannot wait for this creature called man to make the discoveries needed to, to communicate with me. If there's never to be another like me, I'll comfort myself with a remarkable friend like that. You have more friends than you know, Time, but only one capable of interacting with you on such an intimate level. Maybe the love and intimacy between you both can create an equal being such as yourself. Greater things have happened with less. Stick to your pace. Nothing can stop you yet. End of scene. A setting scene by Michael Monson. A concrete bunk and a mirror in ADSEG in December. Okay. The cell is empty. The door is open, ready to receive a new occupant. Good morning, Mirror. I'm hoping we receive a friend that can utilize us well. How about you? Good morning, Buck. Yes, I hope so too. You'll be much more important to whoever it is to whoever it is, though. Nonsense. I truly believe your contributions to our friends are much more important. Thank you for your courteousness, but how can I compare to your contributions? Even though I interact more with our visitors, you provide them with a reminder of who they truly are. So do you. <laughs> I mean, you provide them with the means to reflect just as I do and more. In a sense, yes. But while they utilize me, some things are intentionally left out or forgotten. When they use you, they remember because it stares right back at them. You're right. The scar on our last visitor's face reminded him of the event that shaped his life and made him who he was. He never thought of it on his own with you. Some things are too painful to remember on your own. Reflections in the mind somehow fail to display the truth of who we really are. Your purpose for existing cannot be undershadowed. Thank you, Bunk. I've never felt, I never felt my existence in this cell could compare to the purpose you provide. I realize that my services have value and virtue that only I can provide. Everything great and small in our concrete world has value, virtue, and purpose to our guests. Let us do all we can to help them see that they have the same. Sounds like a plan. I just hope our newest friend doesn't give us more tattoos. We're all blasted up like circus freaks. It's a wonder we still have jobs. <laughs> End of scene. And now we have a comedy scene by Raul Gonzalez. Yeah. Macho is 19 and Mecas is 20. 
They are in Mecho's house, Mecho. and Mecho is pacing back and forth. Where are the? They were here yesterday. What's what is going on here? What's wrong, Mecho? Why are you walking back and forth and talking to yourself? I can't find my jock strap. You what? My jock <laughs> strap. Why are you laughing, Mecca? It's not funny. I got practice in an hour and I and I still have to wash it. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my god, Mecho! You had a game yesterday and you didn't wash your jock strap. Ew! Why? I wash it as soon as as soon as I find it. Is that right? Because it's three fifteen right now, and you have practice at four, and it takes thirty minutes to get there. So it gives you like fifteen minutes to find it and wash it. I, I know. <laughs> Help me look for it, Mikas. Ew! No way. That's nasty. I'm not looking through your dirty jock strap. Well, here's an idea. Follow, follow your nose. <laughs> cool, Mekas. I, I thought you were my friend. Okay, what's not cool is you going to practice in a dirty jock strap. And I am your friend. That's why, that's why I'm still gonna give you a ride. Dirty jock strap and all. Uh, I see you got jokes. <laughs> oh, found it. I see you're gonna have some serious jock itch because you don't have time to wash it. Now shut up and let's go. Hey, Mekas, promise me you won't say anything about the dirty jock strap. Okay, Mecho, I got you. Cool. See, that's why you're my best friend. Oh, yeah. Uh, they both arrive at practice and get out of the car. I I'm here, coach. Hey, everybody. Uh, Mecho's wearing a dirty jock strap. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> A scene by Raul Gonzalez. Soul is a smooth, slow CD, and rock is a fast, rough CD. They're in the disc changer. Soul is grooving, and looking to his side, he sees rock. Rock, what are you doing next to me? You're not supposed to be here till Saturday, man. I know, it's about time I get to share the carousel with you. Yeah, yeah, but you're going to interrupt the flow of the day, the mood. And what's wrong with that? You'll see. There's a reason you're not supposed to be here till Saturday. Oh, yeah? Well, what reason is that? Because you pump people up. I know, it's a wonderful thing, don't you think? Yeah, but on the weekend. Why are you stuck on the weekend thing for? Because our owner won't be able to finish his work when he gets pumped up. Well, then he shouldn't have put me in with you then. End of scene. And now we have a scene in a setting by Raul Gonzalez. The Bible and the Quran are in the chapel in the afternoon, and the Bible is staring at the Quran. Man, I need to find out why there's more than one of me. Hey, Quran. What's up, Bible? I have a question. Why are there more than just me? What do you mean? Well, I mean, if, if my words are the truth, then why are you here? Uh, well, people have different views. But I thought there was only one God, Jesus. Uh, did I get it wrong? Well, yes and no. It's just that people have different names for God. My God's name is Allah. So uh, my words are the same as yours? Do we uh, uh, share the same knowledge? Uh, yes and no. 
In most ways we do, but in some ways we don't. My words are just a different perspective of your words. So who's right, me or you? We're both right, Bible. We both are here for the same reason. And we both shine light and knowledge. End of scene. An object seen by Raymond Reyes. The characters are Paz, a book, and a novel. The setting is in ad seg. It's early morning before cell occupants wake. At rise, Paz and novel are debating. <sighs> really novel? You think you have a better understanding of psychology? Yeah. I was created as a psychology genre, being novel, not fiction like you. Because you're nonfiction, you think you know it all. Think you're all the facts? Well, I'm full of facts too. <laughs> a story is crafted around you. But why are we arguing novel? Because you think you know it all. Look, Paz, if we, if we share truth of, of our people's struggles, no, no matter in what genre of writing, we're doing the same work. You're right, novel. You're right. Whether I share my truth or yours, we have truth in us both. We shouldn't argue instead. Let us encourage one another to encourage more reading. Yes, yes. I've been trying to get you to see that all along, filled with with so many words to, to entertain and educate. We must work as, as a team, one unit with one another and our brothers and sisters for better. I'm with you, Novel. Tomorrow we'll talk more. We'll invite symbols and genius and the others to give their input. Yes, yes, okay, Paz. I cannot wait. We should wake them now. Relax, Novel. The guys are gonna wake up in a minute. Let's get some rest and allow them to escape from this concrete bathroom. But so uncivilized. Okay, Paz. See you when the guys get back, uh, back to dreaming. End of scene. We have a monologue by Philip Alexander. I am a tree. When I was seed, I was told I would be a great tree. For years, I didn't believe. I was smaller than all the other trees. I lived in the park and I longed to be loved by the people who would visit like the other trees, who would be shade for them, who would be shade from the sun and shelter from the rain. Oh, and how the children would climb them. It fascinated me. Their little feet searching for the right spot for leverage. Yes, I wanted to grow, to be a home for the love notes of teenage love in the summertime, to shed my leaves in the fall with colors of orange and red, marking the time of Thanksgiving, to be decorated in winter in celebration of Christmas, and to blossom with the beauty of spring. Then one day, my whole life changed on a bright summer day. The sun was shining as bright as can be. The breeze was soft as I swayed with glee as my branches stretched just as far as can be when I spotted a family's eyes fixed on a tree. Strong, tall, and filled with leaves, roots stretched as far as the eye can see. As I realized in that moment, I had grown strong enough, big enough, because that family's eyes was fixed on me. <laughs> 